All right, guitarist Neely Brosh is my guest today. She has performed and or recorded with Steve Vai, Andy Timmons, the Iron Maidens, Danny Elfman, the Michael Jackson Cirque Show in Vegas, and so much more. And she's got a couple new solo singles out that she's going to tell us all about. And she's going to also go on tour with a band called Death Clock. So great conversation coming right up. Oh, good. How are you? I'm good, Chuck. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, Neely Brosh. But yeah. it, it looks like it's Brosh, but everybody says Brosh. So I'm like, either everyone's saying it right or <laughs> wrong or... Uh, it's yeah. all good. It is That's all good. good. I'll take every version. <laughs> Do people mispronounce it sometimes? Yeah, but it's, you know, I don't know. I feel like because it's not American, it's like, I'll accept it. You know what I mean? It's It's nobody's fault if they're not aware. So... Well, if, they, they, if they're a good uh, <laughs> podcaster or interviewer, they should do their homework. And that's always like the oh, first thing. I was like, okay, I got to make sure I say the name right. But sometimes I listen to interviews and I'll hear it pronounced one way. And then I listen to another interview and it, it it's pronounced another way. And that's, what, well, so that's exactly. why. I was... and that, exactly. Like, that's why you can't, you know, it's nobody's fault. It's all good. Yeah. That's why I ask though, too. That's. Well, yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> so people know, but um, yeah. So you say it's not American. So, cause you grew up in Israel and I, <laughs> I, like I said, I listen to interviews. I didn't hear anybody ask you about that. To me, that's one of the most fascinating things about you. Can you tell me oh. about <laughs> your time in Israel? Sure. Uh, I mean, you know, honestly, because I left when I was 12, almost exactly, um, my view of it really is only as a child in the 90s, you know what I mean? And, and uh, the culture is so different now, and there's so many things that I feel as an outsider – um, but I had a very good childhood and I definitely had the kind of childhood where you play outside with your friends and ride bikes and go to each other's houses and all those great ways to grow up. And, uh, I really missed that when I moved to, to cold New England, do you know what I mean? Uh, and found out about the idea of play dates for the first time in my life. And I was very confused. Um, but yeah, you know, other than that, it's just that's all I knew. Right. So, so you grew up, you say you were outside playing. And so it's safe when you grew up. Cause see, my buddy just went and visited yeah. and he said, um, I mean, obviously he went to like these, like, you know, very sacred uh, places mm -hmm. and there's, right. you know, armed guys with machine guns and sure. stuff. And so yeah. that's a little like unnerving. Like, I mean, right. I know Americans were supposed to be used to guns, but we don't used to seeing people with machine guns, guarding right. things and stuff. So, yeah. um, but that wasn't t the typical, that's not the norm, like going to the grocery store and stuff. You don't see people. Yeah. No, I mean, if you choose to live in an area like that, those are very specific areas, then, you know, you take on whatever security measures you have to take. So maybe the kids that live right there, their parents feel differently, and maybe some of them don't. I don't I don't really know. But just as a kid growing up in a in a city on the coast, it, it was just like everywhere else, you know, we had times that were more stressful uh, war wise and that kind of thing. And that was across the board, but in general, it was just like very normal, like growing up anywhere else. So then was it a culture shock though, coming to America, like you said, in new England, the weather, I would think, especially, yeah. Was that was a big one for sure. And yeah. you know, it's interesting because and I do tell people this story because it, I feel like it all ended well, but, um, you know, I was very into the idea of moving and very, in, you know, into America, what I thought, I knew about American culture because we grew up with nineties TV and that's actually kind of like how I learned English is I learned English from movies and TV and a lot of kids did. Um, and then actually my cousins that are a little bit younger than me ended up all learning Spanish because the, uh, the South American soap operas were so popular there. <laughs> Interesting. I know it's so okay. random, but yeah. like, you know, I learned English and all my, my cousins that were like maybe five years, three, five years younger than me, like spoke Spanish pretty well for a little bit. Um, so anyway, I, you know, from whatever I learned from TV, I thought I was ready to go. Right. And I thought that I was told I would fit in so great. Cause I was very much a tomboy and I liked sports and music and all these things that girls weren't, I mean, I hate to generalize, but at that time I was really made fun of for that. Girls were not super into kicking a soccer ball around or whatever, you know? So it was, it was like very much a, a boy's game. 
So I was told that I was going to fit right in and, you know, have this great time and everything. And then I, I got here and it was not like that, <laughs> you know, like it was very, it was very hard. But, you know, also seventh grade is not the best time to go into a new group of people, even if you do speak the language. So, oh, yeah. No, yeah. I used to work in a, a middle school. I was, I was a counselor. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd see it with new kids. It's tough. Uh, I would see that all the time with Sometimes there was the kids would accept new kids and mm-hmm. be really comfortable. But a lot of times, yeah, it was just like you're on your own. You kind of had to like power through to make friends. And it just ta- it takes time. It takes time. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's like now I'm so grateful for that upbringing because Newton, Massachusetts is like a fantastic place to grow up. And I had good schooling and, you know, all the things. And I look back and I'm grateful for it. But to tell you it was easy, no, it wasn't. To tell you I had a good time in high school, well, not really, you know. Oh, um, even by high school, it was still rough. I I'm, well, I don't know that it was for the same reasons, you know. I just mm. didn't have any, you know, I, I don't think Boston was the right place for me overall. That's why I don't mm. live there anymore. But I think it, it was just, you know, it's rough being a, a teenager no matter where you come from. So I, I know those things now. You just don't think about it when you're going through it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why it's good to have these conversations so that people, mm-hmm. listening, especially like young people can go, Oh, okay. Like, you know, things get better. Obviously yeah. you're doing really well right now with music. Um, so you started music at 12. Mm-hmm. Uh, did that kind of help you get through those teenage years? Like, did you, you weren't able, you weren't able to connect with any other uh, kids who were into music? I, I was, I mean, that's again, it's not, I don't want to make it sound doom and gloom, you know, more than it was. I definitely had a lot of fun things about that. And we had a strong music program in the school that I went to and a lot of kids that were into music. So I, I definitely had a little bit of that. But but yeah, I mean, you know, I practiced a lot during high school and that definitely was a I think a great way to spend my time. What's <laughs> Especially a lot? Especially now looking back. How many What's hours that? a day? What's a lot? I don't know. I mean I just felt like I would come home from school or sometimes not go to school or whatever, you know, and just play guitar. I don't know how much that was, but my thing at that time, and I give that the most credit for what I do now in my life is that I spent time learning any music that I could by ear as much as I could, you know? And so now it's actually a very applicable skill because I have to learn a lot of different sets of music really fast sometimes. And so having being able to rely on my ear in more than one way is just kind of saved my life and it's what allows me to do what I do now. So I'm really grateful that I somehow fell on that and decided to spend my time that way. So you spent a lot, yeah, cause that's interesting. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the eighties metal band sacred, right? But I had their guitarist Wiley Arnett on great mm-hmm. guitar player. And he told me kind of a similar thing where like, when he was in high school, he just got so into guitar. He basically dropped, I think he dropped out of high school is what he told me. And he just played guitar like all day. Yeah, and it seems like that's and if you if you hear stories of Eddie Van Halen, it's the same thing. Like, yeah. like he's always got a guitar in his hand. Like you come yeah. into the dressing room backstage and he's he's just jamming away on a guitar like all the time. It's mm-hmm. crazy to think about that. Yeah, I mean, I definitely didn't leave school, although <laughs> I mean, yeah, I uh, I wish that I could. And yeah. Yeah, the guitar was kind of a saving grace for you, like something that you could focus on a positive that yeah. you found something. Whereas a lot of people, they don't know what their purpose is. They haven't found something they're really interested in like that. So that's- I know. And that's, that's the biggest thing. You know, I think that's the biggest gift in my life that I knew that from early on. And, you know, some people never find a passion and it's, it, I don't know, I'm, it makes them unhappy. And it, like, I, I wish that for everyone, you know? Yeah. So was, it was uh, your brothers that kind of got you into rock at a, at a young age and extreme was one of the mm-hmm. first bands and a, you're a big fan of uh, nuno how big of an extreme fan are you though did did you i am like the biggest one of the biggest extreme fans still, though, <laughs> you to looked this in day? my closet huh you still to this day yeah i, okay. I actually i it's funny that you should say like, i ask i uh recently brought like all my childhood boxes from my parents house and you know and the the collection of like physical b-sides and singles and like every release like you would not believe i have the dream on vinyl i have like i am a real extreme fan wow yeah (laughs) have you heard any of the new stuff oh yeah it's so incredible i i believe me as a fan and as someone who i feel like this is like a like 
they're getting a special place in history. I feel like now it, the do is coming and I'm just, I couldn't be happier that like it's hitting that way now, you know, it's just, can't think of any band that's like more due for that. Yeah, no, it's cool. Cause it's, I had Gary on, uh, a, it was like a, probably like a month ago almost. Oh really? Yeah. And then they told me they're like, okay, you can't release this until I don't uh, know yeah. May 1st or something. I was like, yeah, okay. So I released it May 1st. Then they came back and they said, you have to take that down. You you revealed too much about the new album. So oh, really? <laughs> we went in depth and we went over like like almost every song, I think. Oh, that's until, great. I mean, yeah. we didn't I didn't play any of the music, but I guess I, I revealed too much of the song titles and lyrics and stuff. Uh -huh. So but yeah, when it uh, when the album is released, I think it's June 9th, then the, you can watch my interview if you want. It's only like 30 minutes, but yeah. Yeah, Gary's a really interesting guy. And uh, I really have you heard the full new album or just the stuff that's out to the public? No, I I I I haven't. I'm waiting just like everybody else. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't want to reveal too much, but I think you're really going to enjoy it. I think it's really good. Oh, it, I believe me. Like I just the fact that there's new extreme out there again, like as that little kid fan, like I'm not very hard to please with that, <laughs> but just how mind blowing it is, is just like, it's just beyond for me. I'm enjoying every second. I'm going to be able, I think I'm going to be able to go to the Anaheim show. So I'm again, as a fan, I'm just stoked. So. Yeah. Do you go to a lot of concerts as a fan? I try to go to as much as I can of the stuff that I really like, you know, and uh, that's neither here nor there. Sometimes I feel like the, the time permits and other times it doesn't. So, but, yeah. the, but these are extreme shows. I try very hard because I, I have to say like the, when they did that uh, porno graffiti anniversary tour, I'm still kicking myself that I didn't go to that. That's that's when I was at Cirque full time and I was oh. doing 10 shows a week and getting a leave of absence for any reason was really um, difficult and i'm still like man i should have done that what was i doing what was i thinking it's you know it's my favorite album and uh or same with you know when they just played fenway park opening for aerosmith yeah. and it's like the most boston thing that could ever be yeah i'm just a douche sometimes you know what i mean and so i i can't like i can't miss it when i really can't miss it so. right well i mean your job is important too now if you did get to go do you get like a vip treatment or anything or do you have to is there somebody you could like talk to like you know those guys personally i, I know them pretty well uh i know gary pretty well and he's just been you know a wonderful just you know person to me as a fan for years and years and just you know i was local and all those things and I've, i'm always grateful to him for that but i i don't ask for that stuff you know what i mean like i just i want to just go and have fun in the audience that's funny though like if i was just like rocking out and i turn over and i see you what? Like, <laughs> like, well you know i i like going to shows too or you know like at least the ones that i really want to go to i want to i want to enjoy like like a fan do people recognize you though and go wait aren't you're a famous guitarist too it, it happens every once in a while <laughs> That's pretty cool. It happens. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think you can see my brother and I in that um, the DVD, the live DVD from 2009 that was oh, really? shot in the House of Blues in Boston. Yeah, you can totally see us in the audience. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, I've actually, I've been told that some people were like, hey, you're in that DVD. I'm like, oh, yeah. I oh, remember that night. That's very cool. So you were all, it must have been up in the front then. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we... Again, we we did everything that we could as much as we could, especially when I when I was living in Boston. And I, again, I, I, it dates back so far that I really have to thank my parents because when we moved and I was 12 and I was the biggest extreme fan ever and they weren't together at that point. You know, I went to every signing, every little every sound check, every kind of thing like that. And my parents fucking took me to every one of those things. <laughs> That's and awesome. looking back, it seems ridiculous, you know, but, it, but I went to every clinic and every, like, a, every, like, tribe of Judah, little appearance, and, you know, like, really, I, I feel like a real fan. <laughs> oh, that sounds like, yeah, I love that. that. That's what's so cool about, about this kind of stuff. Like, when you're really into music, and, but mm -hmm. you're also a fan, too. Like, I, I like that. I appreciate it. And that. you know right. what? In 2000, 2001, I was the only 12-year-old there. Like, in that time... Kids weren't into that stuff. Like, right. it's actually, you know, I think rock music and guitar driven music, in, in a sense, is making a comeback. Like, you know, I'll do clinics and I'll see little kids and stuff, but I was really like, that was not a thing. And women, of course, not a lot at the time, but really it was like so weird to everybody else. They were like, what are you doing here? How do you, how do you know about this? <laughs> you know? But luckily, uh, 
it wasn't it's not for nothing right you know i'm there i i love music so no that's great i think it's cool when people just they, that's awesome that you like something that you know wasn't maybe trendy at the time and i think that's and now you're saying like you said they're they're getting more a lot more respect now i know and and we need it you know because there's a void in rock legends right now you know what i mean we don't have a lot of icons left sadly and to think that i get to see my favorite band carrying the torch is like the coolest thing ever so again as just personally i'm i'm so about it i find it so freaking inspiring it's something that especially you know when i was a kid going to those i was really like oh you know extreme is not gonna get back together i'm never gonna get to see them live uh, you know like i'm oh i'm too young to go to the club gigs like you know there were so many things where it could have never been, you know? And so I try to, that's why I try to take advantage of so many opportunities. No. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a great lesson for everybody, not just with uh, music and concerts, but just everything like that in life. Like you just never mm-hmm. know. Yeah. Something could happen. A band member passes away or they break up. Yeah, and then you, over. It's just like, yeah. I mean, there's so many things like that stories, like concerts that I wished I bought a ticket to. Then the guy dies like a month later. It's horrible. And believe me, I have plenty of those. Right. Yeah. You know? And so it's, it's always a lesson of like, yeah, we need to go to more concerts because we don't know how long and then COVID. I mean, you know, it's like these, Oh, yeah, not that's guaranteed right. anymore at all yeah so, yeah, so let, let's talk about that because that that it didn't that inspire uh your first that you have two new singles mm-hmm. and the first one's called song for hope yeah. and that was inspired uh during the pandemic really kind of a slow kind of sad right. beautiful song but like thank it's you. like kind of you feel it like it, it hits you in the feels i think well thank you yeah i mean they were both pandemic songs really which i think it's kind of ironic that they don't sound like at least Lavender Mountains, you know, it's so uplifting to me. Yeah. It's a very happy melody. It's a major key and everything. And I'm just like, oh, I look back to the dates where I was singing those voice memos into my phone just to see how early in the pandemic it was. And it was like early. And I'm just like, where did that even come from in the darkest freaking time, you know? And so I guess the need for that hope really was that strong and that Uh, ended up inspiring the rest of it so you're hearing it now but at least we're in a place where we come full circle enough to to take it in for what it is now right so yeah that's kind of interesting i've never heard of this like these singles being released back to back and they're meant to be listened to sequentially right Right. isn't that like in order like listen Mm -hmm. to song for hope first and then lavender mountains right yeah and and again that was the thing is like they're probably going to be part of a bigger story and will still be sequential on the record, I believe, because, you know, when you listen to at least the audio version of Lavender Mountains, the the video cuts it off, but there's a long intro. And so even though it's not a straight transition, like a really long tune going from Song for Hope to Lavender Mountains, it still feels like that's the next thing in the story. So I wanted to make sure that that was clear. And I also wanted to make sure that people are getting the music as quickly as possible. And I didn't want to make everybody wait until this record is done. So that was kind of the thought process behind it. And um, hopefully it, it registers, you know, but that, that was the idea. So it's going to be like a concept album kind of. In, in a sense, you know, I, I, I feel like those things uh, to me are the result and not the, the like the, the effect and not the cause. That's how it was with my last album spectrum, where it wasn't like I had an idea to put together a record that, showcases all these different genres and how connected they are but it was just the result of all these tunes that i had that didn't seem to make sense in one place but then they really did so i kind of get those after the fact yeah that's interesting too soon to tell (laughs) yeah with spectrum it was it was very eclectic like there was acoustic Mm -hmm. guitars and then i I think i heard like accordions and i Mm -hmm. mean i'm not a musician but i i know there's these are these are not just like typical The, the right. singles you have right now are just more straightforward guitar rock albums, right. whereas Spectrum had a lot of, it was a bigger spectrum, like no right. pun intended. Yeah. No, I mean, it's titled that for exactly that reason, you know, because what it was, was all those songs were coming to me and I liked all of them and they all seemed really different. And I didn't want to bastardize whatever arrangement I thought they should have just to fit them into a mold that didn't really make sense you know so for a while I was like how is this going to work on one album this doesn't sound like it belongs on one album but then slowly I started realizing that between one and at least another song 
there's always some sort of commonality, you know, whether it's a, a chord progression or some kind of instrument color in the instrumentation or a groove or something, you know, it always kind of has something in common with the next thing. And so again, sequentially, then I could kind of order it as like, well, this has this in common with this. So it kind of fades into that and then eventually it fades into that. And again, that was the spectrum. So that was really, again, as a result. And the big thing about that was the, the sequence and trying to figure out, mm. there's a couple of ways that it could have been done arrangement wise, but uh, what I settled on was just kind of how I really saw that story developing. That's interesting. Yeah. Cause like, I see as me as a fan, I, I love when bands are eclectic. Like, I mean, we talk about extreme and when you hear this new album, example, yeah. it, it's all over the place. I mean, mm -hmm. and also I think of like the guns and roses, use your illusions. That's always yeah, my favorite example. That's right. I, I love those albums. And it's like, it's kind of like, to me, I go, I think that's what, how music should be. Like if you're mm -hmm. a band and you can do different styles and kind of mix it up, why, why shouldn't you be able to, if you could do them all well. So I like I, that. I agree. I mean, I, I definitely didn't want to, not release music that I believed in and thought had potential because I didn't think that it fit on a rock album, you know, like that didn't seem like a good enough reason. Mm -hmm. So when it all kind of clears itself up for, you know, that, that that's the, uh, that's the beauty of the uh, DIY world that we live in now. Like I'm not a slave to a record label. That's going to tell me I can't release something like that. I keep a hundred percent of the artistic choices and I like it. Yeah. So this is all self, you're, you're just, you're on your own label or, mm -hmm. or something. Okay. So you could, yeah. See, I feel like that is so much nicer for musicians. I know it was obviously more money back in the day with the records, but it's kind of nice to have that creative freedom and not have to worry about uh, a record label on your back. I would think. Yeah. And Hey, you know, you had to recoup those costs back then too. It's not like it was a gift, you know, they never really paid for it. Like you still had to go out and make the money back. So I yeah. don't know. It's it's not it's a it's kind of a moot point to argue anyway, but I'm glad that I can release the music I want to release. That's that's yeah. Well absolutely. And then I mean I would assume that your bigger moneymaker is not selling music but performing, right? Isn't that like where you probably make a lot more of your of the money, I would yeah. think, is from on the performance end. And you're doing a lot of that. You performed with a lot of different <laughs> Um, yeah. So like, you're going to go on tour with uh, what is it called? De I, I, I've never heard of this band, but it's called Death Clock and it's yeah. spelled and it's uh, apparently it's a it's about it's a, it was a cartoon or a movie yeah. or something, a fictional band. And then they yeah. made like a real band. Is that what yeah. happened? Yeah. So the cartoon is Metalocalypse and it yeah. was on Adult Swim back in the mid 2000s, late 2000s kind of. Um, it was a really it's it's a hilarious cartoon. It had four seasons It didn't get the ending that it deserved, etc huge following um now there's going to be a movie new album score album all this stuff and so uh going on tour with uh baby metal and jason richardson it's going to be a great tour across the states oh so that's is that a pretty big one then because again i'm not familiar with them but it seems yeah. like people okay yeah yeah it's it's, you know the following is very i mean i hate to compare it to anything because generalizations feel so weird but it's almost like a comic con kind of a oh, cult following cult following yeah, yeah yeah where it's just like the characters mean so much to a lot of people and the the show is i mean it's a really great show you should i mean i can't imagine you not digging it it's, oh, I'm sure. it's on I hbo it. it's on hbo max oh, these days so you can i do have it hbo out. i there love it that sounds that sounds right up my alley. I love I love cartoons. You will love too. it, and and the episodes are short, especially the first ones. They're like ten minutes each. It's very like classic Adult Swim type. Humor. Okay, so yeah, I'll yeah. check that out. Uh, yeah. you, now, are you guys coming to Phoenix, or where are you playing? Uh, I think more we round are. Here? Yeah, we oh, really? are. Yeah, towards the I, I believe so. Towards okay. the end, we're I'll coming to, to Vegas too. I yeah. can't believe it. I'm like. Wow. Oh, cool. I want a tour that comes through my hometown. Like, hell yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I was just in Vegas for the ugly kid, Joe Fozzie show Oh, nice! at the, uh, what was it called? The uh, hard rock in that venue. Yeah, that I don't yeah. know if you've ever seen a show there or played there, but I have, neat venue. yeah. Yeah. Do you go out in Vegas a lot or not a lot? Again, same thing where it's like, if it's a show that I really need to see or friends in town and they're playing, like I try to make as much as I can. Um, and I have seen like great shows come through here, whatever does come through here, because not everything does, but. Which I, ones, uh, um, what are, or what are your favorite Vegas shows to see or Vegas things, mm. restaurants or things to do? Cause I go to Vegas all the time. So I'm always looking for recommendations. 
uh, well, I hate to be biased. Obviously, the Michael Jackson yeah, one. Yeah, it's just, Ani, yeah. like, because again, okay, right, it's going to sound so biased, but the show is amazing. I saw and that one, is, yeah. Oh, you, you've seen it? Yeah, I saw, I just okay. looked it up because I saw it in 2018, so I was trying to oh, figure out. Oh, you saw me in it? I saw you then. Wow, oh, yeah. Crazy. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was I awesome. I mean, assuming there was a guitar player in it that night and I wasn't like sick or injured, that was me. That's very cool. Yeah, yeah. I remember it being really good. I, it's an amazing show. I mean, listen, they it's an amazing production. What they did with the music is incredible. The dancers are incredible. The acrobats. I, it's, it's a, it is one of the most popular shows in town, like I will say. So um, the Beatles love show is another yeah. really, really good one. I've seen that twice. That's, That's really a great good. one. Yeah. Absinthe is really good. Um, it's kind of more cabaret uh, circusy. They act. They're, they're in an actual tent, which is cool. Oh, okay. um, and the acts are really great. Um, so that's more like a classic Vegasy type thing. Um, there's tons of residencies in town. So chances are a favorite artist is passing through, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, we do have a lot of great restaurants. A lot of them are really off the strip and we have oh, uh, really? Spring Mountain and like the area where there's a lot of really great Asian food. And, oh. um, so yeah, there's a lot to explore. For yeah. Sure. It's fun. I love every time I go, I always find something new and like, we found this place called, uh, it was called brew dog. It's like on the roof. It's next to hard rock. I was like, this is so cool. I'm on the roof and you can see the. Yeah. The and that's like, like just a little bit off the strip. So those areas yeah. are nice because you're not right on the strip with all the crazy, but you're still, you know, there's a lot. And again, it's just like the closer you are to that, the more touristy and the more expensive it's going to be. But the town around it, you know, we're very spoiled. We have a lot of good stuff going on that are just, is, is just for locals because nobody ever really thinks it exists. And anyone who comes out here is here for a different reason. So. Right. Oh. Yeah. Isn't that where the best gambling is too off the strip? That's what I heard. Is it that like I don't that I can't tell you. I'm you don't gambling. gamble and you live no. in Vegas? Well, really? that's probably why I sh I can stay here. You know what oh, I mean? True. Like you should not be you should not be living here if you're into gambling, actually. <laughs> yeah, no, that's probably why I probably wouldn't last very long if I moved there. <laughs> um so we got to talk about uh two or you know you're still playing with Danny Elfman or you you mm -hmm. you, don't, you guys don't do a lot of live shows though, right it's more just studio we, stuff or? we've done we've done a, a bunch we've done Coachella and we played at the Hollywood Bowl last year which was incredible we we have a couple of shows coming up early this summer in San Diego and Irvine um but I mean it's a put together yeah. you know? so they it's can't a, you can't tour with it is what I'm saying right I don't know that you can't but I mean yeah. it's just it's a it's a big undertaking so I think it takes a long time to plan you know it's 50 yeah. musicians on stage and what is it yeah i mean gosh it's so cool that to to work with like how did he did he recruit you for that job or how did how did you guys uh get land or how did you land that gig i guess so his uh studio manager at the time uh melissa mcgregor uh, i'm not sure if that's exactly the the title that's why i say at the time but she was looking for band members and had asked a composer friend Mikkel Hurwitz. Uh, went to school with my brother for oh. recommendations and he had put my name in the hat. I didn't, I don't, re I hadn't remembered him. I guess I had met it like, you know, cause he was a friend of my brother's and I was just like, you know, but then I just got a phone call and I literally, you know, was like, okay, I'm going to let it go to voicemail. I don't know this number. If, if it's a gig, they'll leave a message, you know, and my next thought was like, it's never a gig, <laughs> you know? And then I listened to the voicemail 10 minutes later and I'm like, what? So I came and auditioned and uh, the rest kind of went from there. That's so cool. But it was, it was not like, that was the last thing I ever thought ever, ever in life. You know? That's just, it's so neat though, that you have that passion. You love guitar and then your career progresses to that point where Danny Elfman's calling, Hey, you want to like work with me? I mean, that's just like amazing. That's like it's so cool. And like how many other opportunities thing. you'll have like that? I'm I sure. Know, I know. It's just, it's, I still don't believe it. You know what I mean? That's the thing. I get, I understand like what are the odds of something like that? So yeah, it's, it's especially great. I'm not in the film world. You know what I mean? Like I, I, it's just, it's something I never even would have con like thought is a thing. So yeah, no, it's cool. And you've played with so many great, uh, besides, uh, Danny Elfman. I mean, you were in the iron maidens for a little bit and, uh, and uh, what else? I mean, God, you've done so many other cool. There was a huge list. Now I've lost the list. <laughs> no, it's all good. There's, there's so many things that you've done. I mean, all those things that we've already mentioned, obviously. And then you've 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 met some interesting people too that I saw on your mm -hmm. Instagram. Like 
uh, you know, Steve Stevens, Steve Vai. I yeah. had uh, Steve Stevens on the show. You've obviously met Nuno. Right. Uh, you met Jason Becker, which is really cool. And a, yeah. a Backstreet Boy. I'm like, wow, this is like <laughs> kind of a fun right. life you're leading over here. I'm very blessed. Like, I'm just trying to keep doing this for a lot, as long as they'll let me. That's that's what I say, you know? Yeah, very cool. Well, the new so, singles are out now. People can check those out and hopefully more music. And then, uh, yeah, you'll be on tour with Death Clock. And then I always end up promoting a charity or a cause. Yeah, so I thought about that. that. Yeah. Uh, I would love to recommend... Um, it's a dog rescue. It's a Saving Carolina Dogs rescue, which is the breed of my dog, Micah. Um, it's kind of a half feral type of wild breed dog that is not very well known at all. Most mm. I didn't know about it until I had one. That's most owner's stories. Um, and they rescue them. They do great work and they do great work for awareness. And Okay, what is it called again? Save Car Saving Carolina Dogs. Okay, I'll put that in the show notes along with your website so people can follow you. All right, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, see you later. Yeah. My thanks once again to the very talented Neely Brosh. Check out her new singles on streaming or, or however you get your music and see her on tour with Death Clock. Uh, make sure to follow her on social media. And remember, your likes, shares, and comments on there help more people see things. And that works the same way with this podcast. So also make sure you're subscribed to my YouTube channel. I've got some exciting stuff planned that's only going to be available there. Uh, I appreciate all your support. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.